So yeah. welcome everybody to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke, I'm the director of the Siegel Center. We are thrilled that we're actually back online, live. I mean, not online, but live. <laughs> we did our preludes uh, digitally and last year CUNY was still closed. We couldn't do it, but it's very important for us you know, to celebrate uh, the life and the work of New York theater artists making art is incredibly hard anywhere in the world. Making it in New York is extremely hard, but after the time of Corona, there's an extra level of it. And um, we have the murder room investigation going on at the moment uh, with Anne Rushbone, who says, just imagine New York downtown theater is a body, maybe a dead body, who killed it, why? And so she's doing one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, in her to sign up. But also I think this evening is part of it, but in a good way. It doesn't look at the dead body, but says, what is the future? Where are we going to? And, uh, and uh, in the reincarnation, there's the big question, is it a renaissance, something that was before, and it comes back, or is it a revolution? Maybe it wasn't so great before, so we'll have to see uh, what these young, young scholars, artists, thinkers think, and I think it's important to hear from them, and not from the people who run the institutions. I think they are the future of the theater. And, um, and it's a space to discuss, to hear your ideas and uh, to see what's, what's on your mind. So really thank you all for coming out, especially on such a beautiful day. And thank you to Nick and to Jesse for putting this together. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, as you just said, my name is Jess Applebaum and uh, you are at Future Visions for locations for the next performance ecosystem. Um, and we're going to be as brief as possible, Nick and I, so because there's a lot of material to get to. But we also wanted to give you some grounding and some context to tonight. And so, um, and we also wanted people to be able to arrive, which I think has happened. Um, so I'm just going to jump in and just remind us that we're at the Graduate Center, and it's on the Nopehawking territory on the island of Manhattan, and we're in a building that used to be a department store built the Altman. And I just like to point that out because it lets us know that there are capitalist spaces that can be transformed into public good. So just to remind us of that and Eric Adams. So, um, so yes, and then we are with Prelude and it's the 20th anniversary of Prelude. And so congratulations to that, Frank. Um, Prelude is meant to be a meeting place for, um, I just want to make sure I'm getting my language right, for artists who are at the forefront of contemporary performance in New York City. Uh, and it is curated by Frank, and there are people that we would love to thank, Taylor Everts, Ann Kreitman, Renato Pereira, and Alison Pascal, who just started jumping in today and are making everything happen, so thank you for that. Um, as Prelude is dedicated to artists at the forefront. The festival gives us a space to discover the voices that are shaping the fields of both live performance and also academic scholarship. And the research and scholarship at the GC manifests in many different forms. Uh, Nick and I uh, met actually in 2014 prior to coming to the GC on a project called the Brooklyn Commune. And that was a public research project led by artists surveying and reporting on the economy of our performance arts landscape. And now here at the GC, uh, as students in the performance and theater program, um, we both received fellowships uh, to work with Public Lab, which had been a public humanity center. And that was where we were given the space to bring our full selves to our work as academics, to bring our values, to bring our communities, to bring the research that we were interested in, and then to develop ways of connecting our scholarship with those communities, and then further communities as well outside of the possibilities that we were thinking. So during that time, Nick and I developed Edge Effect Media Group, and that is a think and do tank, and it brings people from a widespread array of disciplines together in dynamic gathering spaces to study major issues of our time. And then we take what we've learned, we translate our collective learning into public knowledge through creative original works that manifest in an array of media. And the people that we have with us today 
uh, are people who have been engaged with Edge Effect and also with Nick and I for the 20 plus years that we've been working as practitioners. Um, so thank you all for being here and with us. Um, and as practitioners, um, I'll share that um, I've been working with Linear Lease for over 20 some years, and Nick has been working with, with the Assembly for quite some time as well. And there are independent projects and relationships that we've been developing as well. Um, for a practice that we do as Edge Effect um, is we identify the edges that we have with ourselves. And we think about how we would like people to know how we are showing up in spaces. And we do that with sharing these edges, which we've taken from uh, the uh, environmental, environmental sciences and with uh, the arts uh, and, um, sorry, I'm gonna slow down and start again there. Um, we practice um, uh, edges, which comes from an ecological term, edge effect. And those are when ecosystems meet an overlap of borders and form unexpected dynamic forms of life, as well as new forms of networks. Um, and we recognize that within ourselves, there are lots of ecosystems in us. And so, and there's a lot of diversity within ourselves. And so we are showing up here with our edges uh, and mine, which I'll share with you are that I'm an academic practitioner or a scholar practitioner. I'm a dramaturg. Uh, I'm an introvert extrovert. So public speaking is not my favorite thing to do. Um, and I think that's part of my Gemini-ness. Um, and um, I am very close to being a third generation New Yorker with grandparents having come over here and having connections to the Bronx, to Brooklyn, to Queens, Manhattan, and now Queens again. So I'll pass it over to Nick. Thank you, Jess. I am Nick Benassaraf. My pronouns are he and they. Um, my edges are, uh, a lot of them are lumped under the banner of space maker. Um, that includes my work as a set designer, as a director, and as an artistic director. Um, I'm also a facilitator of activist spaces, an interdisciplinary scholar, and like just a student here at the CUNY Graduate Center. The drive to gather here today comes from a deep desire to learn who is still here in the community. Um, in the last month or two, our field has begun a kind of reckoning uh, about the changes going on in our ecosystem. Um, and of all the online articles and social media posts and conversations that have come of it, um, one of them has been sticking with me. Uh, a few months ago, Jim Nicola, who is the art outgoing artistic director of the New York Theater Workshop, was being interviewed here. And um, he proposed that you know all the economic models that were supporting the 20th century theater didn't die in the year 2000, like many thought they would, but they died in the last couple of years or are in the way out, on the way out. Um, and that comes on the heels of the We See You White American Theater Movement, um, which has continued to uh, influence theaters and individuals nationwide towards anti-racist action, concrete action. And it builds on our knowledge that we've all already known, which is that it's hard and demanding to be a theater maker in New York City. Um, to name some of those demands, there is systemic racism, classism, sexism, ableism, ageism, decades of eroding economic support, rising rents and closing performance spaces, extractive practices by the commercial theater sector and by the academy, which takes without giving back to the ecosystem, and the siphoning of attention to digital media, just to name a few. Um, against this backdrop, we have asked these folks to write manifestos on very short notice, which is a fairly absurd thing to do, um, but we like them. Even though manifestos have never succeeded for speaking for all of the people, and there will be enormous ideas and voices not represented here today, um, we still love them because they are powerful and provocative way um, to vision, to something against which we can bounce and learn about ourselves. Um, so we wanna kind of take this visioning and decouple it from the historical avant-garde as we often are taught it and learn it, um, 
First of all, it's because it's a model that sometimes holds us back. Um, in one sense, it assigns an impossible amount of credit to usually one individual, usually a, a straight cis white man. And second of all, it sets up change in warlike terms, the avant-garde being the front lines of the battle. We think of the edge effect concept as a kind of alternative. We love it because when you consider it as a cultural metaphor, the edge effect describes what happens when two or more ecosystems overlap and the new kinds of ideas and forms that can come from that space. It's not a person, it's a community, it's a place that generates these ideas. And that's part of what we're here to foster today. So to get to the actual thing, our event is gonna unfold in three sections. First, we're gonna ask our panelists to uh, share the manifestos that they prepared. Um, then we're going to get on our feet and do an activity called Spectrum of Opinions. And third, we're going to have a roundtable discussion, the normal thing that we usually come to the theater to do in these contexts. Um, in parts two and three, there will be opportunities for you to chime in using your phone. So you could feel free to have that at the ready. Um, and that goes for those of you at home as well. Uh, we are here to dig into big ideas and to have a good time doing it. And to that end, it, it feels like it would be even extra more fun to lower our stakes and our expectations of this conversation. And by lowering the stakes, I mean that this panel is intended as a play space. Um, it's, a, it's a place we want to invite everyone on stage to speak in drafts, to try on new ideas and see how they feel and we won't hold each other to these opinions forever. They're just what's coming out right now. Um, and by lowering our expectations, I mean that we're not trying to solve these problems definitively or come up with a unanimous answer about how to do that. Um, rather, we wanna provide opportunities for us all to dig deeper into it. So for the main event, today we are honored to be joined by Chie Morita, Jesse Cameron Alec, Marisol Rosa Shapiro, Marisol Soledad, Jimena Garnica, Beto Orburn, and Yanki Dimos. Um, yeah. And we're gonna invite folks to deliver their, their preparations in that order. And then we'll talk. Hello. There I am. Hey, y'all. Um, I am also not a public speaker, so um, here I go first. Uh, <laughs> my name is Chia Monica. I use she her pronouns, um, and my edges are I, I come in primarily as a consultant as a person who uh, looks at systems from the outside and sort of like worms my way in and then makes a swift exit um but I am also a tinkerer I like to think that I specialize in navigation um and I'm also Nisei uh which recently has done more to affect my process and the, the way that I think about the world um so I did not have the benefit of your tremendous definition of manifesto while I was writing this. <laughs> so I took to the internet <laughs> and the internet, uh, the more research that I did, uh, the thing that I really got stuck to is that manifestos seem to think that they're supposed to be an answer and that we're all supposed to agree. Um, and that that answer is linked to a plan of action and a way to know when we succeed to have a clear definition of what success looks like. So I landed on the definition of manifestos, that manifestos are a definition of success. So inviting us all into that play space, will you all close your eyes with me? Follow my voice. I'll tell you when to open your eyes again and do whatever is comfortable here. You can stop at any time. You can open your eyes if you want to take seats or like lay on the floor. You, you do, do what you need to do. Um, but I'd like to take a moment as we get started today to really remind us all that we have bodies. 
Put your feet flat on the floor, maybe. Give them a little wiggle. That feels good. Wiggle those toes around in your socks all the way down through that carpeted floor, through that department store floor. <laughs> There's dirt down there somewhere. Remember to breathe as you're doing this. If your knees could do anything they wanted right now, what would they do? Maybe stretch your fingers. Remember that you have ribs, <laughs> likely 24 of them. Maybe move your, move your face into a silent expression of your day. Scream, laugh, bury your teeth. I don't know, no one's watching except me, I'm watching. <laughs> Let your face be a face, let your body be a body, and keep breathing. Now, keeping your eyes closed and in your head for a moment, allow yourself to define success for yourself. Really hear it ring out in your head. Now, whose voice is that definition in? Let's go a little deeper. I really want you to define success for you. If the prompt feels like a struggle, remember that you bring the whole last world into existence all the time on a daily basis. Simply apply that creativity to your own existence. Allow yourself to dream big, dream the way you want. Maybe it's got something to do with practice or family or sustainability. Maybe it's about fear or anger or love. Is it in your voice now? I think the best way to succeed is to define success for yourself. And I don't think that we spend enough of time as individuals doing it. You can open your eyes. Thanks for going there with me. So, I don't think we can build the next performance ecosystem without attending to a new human ecosystem first. I think that we begin that work by grounding ourselves in what we need today and now and in the future. Your powerful definitions of success will defy the received wisdoms and violent voices of our governments and our systems, as well as the loving and noisy and complicated voices of our ancestors. And these dreams, are the fuel with which we can prioritize ourselves and our communities, and then, and only then, allow that to seep into a better way of making. My complicated ancestors raised me with an untranslatable concept called kejimit, everywhere growing up. It's one of those DNA level ideas that's baked into my being, as I'm sure you all have ideals that are baked into yours and can fill me with equal parts of shame and pride on any given moment, but I embody it, I think, <laughs> as an understanding of context and how to choose to act accordingly in any given moment. Some examples, I turned on the light because I needed it, so I won't turn it off. I see a person approaching a closed door with their arms full of things and I, empty armed, will choose to help them. Uh, I said I would deliver a manifesto, <laughs> so here I am manifesting it. I begin a loop and I close it. My definition of success is my context. And newly equipped with our visions of utopia, our visions of utopia, we can build spaces and cultivate relationships and reimagine systems and make work that demands these destinations for us. We can nurture a new culture that insists on new ways of doing, which will in turn create ripples of context that demand others uphold these values too. People over product, process over productivity. Let your context be contagious and act accordingly. Thanks, y'all. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Jesse Cameron Alec. I'm so happy to be on stage with all of you. Like, yeah, 
really and truly. Um, I'm also obsessed with this idea of edges. It's very, very interesting in this ecological term. I'm going to talk to a lot of people about it. Um, uh, uh, so my edges are that mm, I am a dramaturg. I think first and foremost, a theatrical dramaturg. I'm also a poet um, and a playwright. And I am a queer underground club person. That's a big sort of... <clears throat> Uh, ecosystem that I exist in. Um, uh, I'm a first generation American and uh, I am a science fiction expert. <laughs> All very important things. Um, I'm also a Scorpio and it's fall. It's, you know, this Halloween sort of thing. So we're going to tell you a ghost story. <laughs> <clears throat> Why can't the American theater change? We all want to change. We all know that this isn't working. There are programming problems, financial issues galore. The influence of commercial money is destroying things. Artistic development houses are crashing. Donors vanishing, audiences not returning. No one is getting paid enough. Everyone is leaving the industry and not returning. Why? Because people are unhappy. You can feel it when you walk into a theater. The artists are unhappy. The technicians are unhappy. The administrators are unhappy. Have you ever met an artistic director before? They are the most unhappy people in the entire planet. <laughs> the ship is full of holes and we can see the water coming in. Why can't we do anything about it? Maybe we don't want to, or maybe there's something else that doesn't want to. Have you heard of the term egregore? Um, my boyfriend, Fernando Gregorio brought the concept um, to me about six months ago, and he and I have been tossing it around ever since. An egregore is an occult concept that originated from the Book of Enoch, which has its roots in ancient Hebrew mysticism. But as um, uh, um, the choreographer Adesala um, Osalakumi taught me, there's actually parallels in the Yoruba tradition for this concept as well. In brief, an egregore is a non-physical entity that is made material and brought into physical existence by the collective belief of a people. A family might gather together the power of its love and manifest an archangel that comes to life and with a flaming sword, it protects the ancestral lands. Or a town of people might summon a great monster that runs wild devouring little children created purely by the power of their bigotry. Egregores are not often created consciously. In fact, it's most likely that an egregore um, is created unconsciously accidentally by a massive act of groupthink. The egregore is consensus made manifest. From the first moment that the egregore is born, um, excuse me, from the first moment that the egregore is born, it has purpose. It knows exactly what it's there to do, and it seeks out um, a, a means of doing it immediately. Just as quickly, the egregore separates itself from the people that created it. The creators no longer have dominion over the creation. The creation is an organism all into itself. It will continue to feed off of the love of the family or the hatred of the village, but it doesn't take orders anymore. The egregore lives to do two things. It's given task and like any other organism to maintain its own existence. I hate to be the one to, to break it to you, but your theater is haunted. <laughs> there is an egregore living inside of your walls. There is an entity that is the institution that you work at. It has interests and desires. It has moods and issues um, that are unique unto itself. It was created long before you arrived at that theater and it will be there long after you are gone. You could replace every single person at your institution and the institution would behave exactly the same way because the egregore is more than the people who are there. You can have endless meetings about cultural transformation and not change a single thing about the way that you do business. The egregore wants to be itself. The Spiritus Instituti was summoned into existence to do a job in a certain, a yeah, little Latin joke for you. Um, um, it was summoned into existence to do a job and in a certain, um, and it, uh, excuse me, it was summoned into existence to do a job in a certain manner and it will not rest until that job is done. Can you see what your egregore looks like? Can you hear its voice speaking through the mouths of your managers? Can you feel how it moves through um, um, your building, stacking boxes in that one corner where everyone hates for there to be boxes, but somehow there's always boxes ending up there? Can you see how it makes important decisions for you? It guides institutions' budgets, its goals, values, and daily emotions. And as you go from one institution to another, can you feel how the egregores actually feel very similar? Same, same, but different? The tensions between the production department and the administrative department, the stress of tech week, 
how every leader thinks that if they don't stay at their institution for at least 30 years, the entire institution will crumble. The ways in which we must bite our tongues and uh, sometimes engage in distasteful conversations with donors. The problems there are the problems here. They don't change. The spirit is the same. Imagine with me that the American theater has an egregore as well, a big looming Goliath, hands that stretch across state lines, a neck as wide as the Rocky Mountains, thighs falling off our southern borders, shoulders so broad that they rub against our coasts. Imagine the energy contained within that egregore. Imagine the power. Imagine the potential. Imagine the power of what it wants. Remember, it wants to continue to exist. An existence for an egregore means existing as it currently exists, eating the same food, making the same kind of art, working with the same kind of people. Egregores don't want to change. This is the reason why, ironically, even as systems begin to fail, even as the flow of donations dry up, even as audiences stop re responding to certain kinds of arts, even as the egregore begins to starve itself to death, it has great difficulty adapting. And it will stop you from adapting as well. Uh, I Googled egregore. Um, and uh, the word egregore comes from egregoris, which means wakeful. And I think it's a useful word, uh, root word for the concept that we're talking about. Do we try to change the egregore, knowing how difficult that will be, knowing the self-awareness and almost impossible collective buy-in that would take? Or do we try and kill the egregore, drive it off a cliff, like the, a mob from a black and white movie that would kill a monster? Or do we reach out to heal the breach between us and the egregore with love, as mythic knowledge would guide us to do? Or do we build our own egregores, summon our own spirits in new bodies? These are the questions that I lay at your feet. The egregore is ever wakeful, and we must be as well. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Thanks, Jesse. I just want to um, point out that the, the shadow up there of those two lights kind of looks like a dragon. <laughs> like, well, Egregore looking down at us from, from the ceiling. I noticed that while you were speaking. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Marisol. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am a theater maker. I wear many hats. I'm a performer, I'm a director, uh, I'm a teaching artist, I'm a facilitator of all kinds of creative space, um, I'm a collaborator, I'm a, I'm a born and bred, born and raised in New York City, I'm a Jew Yorican, um, I'm Boricua, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Uh, all right. Um, oh, and uh, one other thing that you should know uh, is that I, I make a lot of different kinds of work. Uh, some of it uh, kind of on the range uh, from like nasty, fun political satire to really gentle shows for tiny babies. <laughs> um, and so I'm speaking to you today in part as an advocate for children and for theater for young audiences. Uh, if this manifesto had a title, it would be, why didn't you make it more interesting? <laughs> Last spring, I made my off-Broadway directorial debut, mounting a show called Wink, or remounting a show called Wink, uh, which was created by Brooklyn's Spellbound Theater. We uh, opened over at the New Victory on 42nd Street, right in the middle of Times Square, uh, you know, prime real estate across the street from Madame Tussauds. Uh, this gentle show for very young theater goers, was recommended uh, for young people ages three to five, uh, had been in Spellbound's uh, repertoire for years. It had been developed uh, over many years, had played uh, two amazing kids in Miami at the Long Island Children's Museum at Symphony Space and many, many places before that. And we were really excited to bring this dreamy, wordless piece full of shadow puppetry and animation and object transformation uh, to our big, bright audiences of little, little, little ones arriving from schools all over New York City uh, to our big, beautiful theater on 42nd Street. During the show, especially during education performances when kids were coming uh, from school, there was cooing and clapping in the audience and oohs and ahs, and the 500 seat New Victory was like a baby rave. 
And, uh, you know, in these audiences for education shows, uh, we had the powerful ratio of like one adult to every 10 to 20 children. So you can imagine like uh, just almost 500, like five-year-olds in our 500 seat house. It's really incredible. Um, so one of my favorite parts of shows at the New Victory, uh, where I've worked now as an artist in several capacities and also as a teaching artist, uh, is the post-performance discussions, which I'm sure we have many feelings about. Uh, but at the New Victory, they're pretty amazing. Um, so after an hour-long experience of art created especially for them, the young people are invited to ask, and sometimes they say some pretty fantastic and provocative things. Uh, a few highlights from our Wink talkbacks. After one show, a student who'd been seated in a balcony spot with some kind of special uh, sight lines <laughs> began recounting in detail in a sort of mumbled stream of consciousness how we'd achieved every single moment of magic in the show. Uh, a designer mind, an engineer, I don't know, a technician, a director, he was up in the balcony. One student asked, after this beautiful artistic experience, why can't we eat in the theater? Uh, and one student who's likely uh, a little bit developmentally advanced for this particular really gentle show for babies basically asked, why didn't you make it more interesting? <laughs> um, so after taking a moment to scrape my ego off the floor, um, I was struck by the power of this question and by the consideration it provoked for me, why didn't you make it more interesting? Theater for young audiences in this country, uh, I would say even within our artistic community uh, has kind of a poor reputation in a lot of circles, um, as do children. Both are often marginalized, under-considered and under-resourced. Uh, expected to conform to adults' expectations that they will behave like smaller, if stupider, adults uh, in, for children under-resourced schools, under-resourced healthcare, under-resourced food systems, and bloated carceral ones. Children the world over um, are a marginalized class, and they're subject to, subjected to poverty and war and all kinds of violence that adults and our systems uh, foist upon them with little, if any, agency to meaningfully resist, to demand change or accountability. And so uh, in our country, for sure, the economics of art and, and aesthetic education and aesthetic experience uh, feed into and reflect right, this marginalized status of young people and children. And so they are left asking us, all of us, why didn't you make it more interesting? Uh, and here we are, a group of thoughtful, creative, boundary-breaking adults working at the, what is it, forefront of contemporary performance. Um, and so I invite you to ask yourselves, all of you, uh, what can you do to make it more interesting? If you're excited about having an audience that will dream and imagine with you, that will engage you, ask you hard questions, why can't I eat in the theater and why didn't you make it more interesting? Uh, I invite you to consider making work for young people and for families. New York City in particular is the largest school system in the country. We just welcomed this fall at at least 20,000 newly arrived immigrants into our schools, many of them displaced from home by violence, climate catastrophe, and desperate economic circumstances all over the world. And we as artists are nimble enough to respond to this changing world and to uncertainty and to help our young people process the same. <clears throat> young people are actually the emerging moment embodied. And New York City kids, as I'm sure many of you know, are savvy, sometimes very sassy, extremely wise, and a ton of fun. So the last provocation I'll leave you with uh, is something that I came across today, actually, in my capacity as an arts educator and teaching artist. This comes from the GIVE Guide, which stands for Growing Inclusivity for Bri uh, Vibrant uh, Engagement. 
This is an amazing comprehensive document that you can find online. Again, it's called the Give Guide. It was created by a Community Word Project, Arts Connection, and the New Victory. And in particular, out of this very, very, very robust resource, I wanna share um, something called the Seven Rights to the Body. Uh, and this is quoted from the guide, from the Give Guide. Um, these seven rights to the body are a consensus of shared values gathered from Eastern and indigenous philosophy, religious beliefs, and human rights organizations. You can use these rights as a pedagogical guide, or I would say an artistic guide, to create a safe space for all learners or artists or emerging artists or emerging arts audiences, um, and to empower them to be advocates for themselves. Here we go, the seven rights to the body. The right to be present, to exist in any space. The right to feel, to experience and express emotions. The right to act, to express yourself in your own way. The right to love and be loved, to lead with your heart. The right to speak, to articulate yourself in a verbal or nonverbal way. The right to see, to notice or sense your own way and the right to know or to understand. Thank you. Thank you all. It's so beautiful to hear each of you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jimena Garnica. I use she and they pronouns. Um, I forgot that we were supposed to introduce ourselves. And um, so I didn't prepare the introduction, but uh, I am I am here. <laughs> um, I am the daughter of Edirma Gomez and Jaime Garnica. They are in Colombia, my parents um, are an immigrant. I was born in the land called now Colombia, uh, but I'm a uh, United States citizen. Um, I share my life partnership and artistic partnership with a Japanese creature that appeared in my life over 20 years ago, Chige Morilla. And um, we love imagining things and creating things. And yeah, it's like creation and imagination. And that means that I make works in different mediums, in different spaces with different people. Um, and I didn't bring a manifesto, I confess. <laughs> I was like, I can't write a manifesto in two weeks. <laughs> Um, but um, but I I want to ask everybody here for a second to look at the title of today's event and think about one word that comes to your mind, one word only. And I'm actually going to ask the audience to vocalize that word. Like maybe we start from the back to the front. You can say it loud and just one word really quickly. Maybe we start back there with you. Louder, sorry. Provoke. The gentleman back there, he's passing. Thank you. Um, so maybe a manifesto will emerge from me after today. I am already so inspired. Um, and I'm, I'm remembering I had this really amazing time this year in Colombia. And um, one of the things that I kind of like relieved and um, like lived again um, was this idea of gathering in a Cusmuy, is a, a casa de pensamiento is the house of thought, and to share la palabra, to share the word. So instead of panels, there are many talk circles, and I'm looking forward to the second part of this event. Um, I spent um, that time and really confirmed how, how much I love those talk circles, and I like them because of their horizontality, their multiplicity. 
Um, so after some thinkings, I thought I would share my reflection on the title of today's event, Future Visions, Provocations for the Next Performance Ecosystem. On future, the future is no fixed endpoint, but rather an ongoing process of becoming. The future is happening, is an ongoing process of becoming. This future may not be singular. These futures are plural and are in ongoing process of becoming. On visions, I prefer to think of dreams, those thoughts, images, and sensations, those ways to connect and to be in relation with the natural world and understand its rhythms, its cycles, the way it breathes, Dreams that reveal messages from animals, from plants, from other elements of the natural world and beyond my own world, beyond my human own individual world. On provocations, my personality has a thing for provoking, but somehow that is not how I felt about this title. The word that came was intentions. Intentions as chair introspections through words. And that resulted in caring. So instead of, instead of provocations, I ended up with intentions of caring for. So, so far I have ongoing dreams, intentions of caring for on the next. If the future is an ongoing process of becoming, next doesn't really follow an immediate order, time, space, place, sequence. So I refuse to think of the next performance ecosystem as if we're something that comes after the current one. The next is already happening, back again to becoming, to a constant state of becoming. So the next is already happening, maybe not where some of us might be used to inhabit, but it's definitely out there and happening. So instead of next, I start thinking of all, as in total, the whole of, intentions of caring for all. On performance, here I kept the word performance. Only many questions came. As in, not only theater and dance, right? As in, not only Eurocentric, Euro-American theater and dance, right? Performance as experience, as rituals, as ceremonies, as various cultural practices, question mark, question mark, question mark. And lastly, ecosystem. What if we make it plural? Just as if I was going to keep the word future, it will have become futures. So ecosystems, worlds and webs of interconnected relationships. Ecosystems are integrated networks of plants, animals, humans, and environments, all dependent of one another. And this led me to think about sustainability, but that was just a thought. So after I excavated the title of today's event, future visions, provocations for the next performance ecosystem, I ended up with another title and not yet with a manifesto. Ongoing dreams, intentions of caring for all performance ecologies. Thank you, everyone. Hello, my, my name is Beth O'Byrne. My edges, I think the first one I am with today is I'm the co-founder of Radical Evolution Performance Collective. Um, I, through that company, I work a lot as a playwright and as a musician um, and as a general theater maker in ensemble and collective practice. Um, I am also a writer of anarchist speculative fiction. Ask me about it if you want. Um, uh, and a new edge that I have been carrying with me lately, and I think is becoming more and more important to me these days, is uh, as a border abolitionist. I'm still working on what that means in an activated way, uh, but it's something that feels present to me a lot. So uh, yeah, so here's what I came up with. In 2011, Morofi and I sat at a park bench in Inwood Hill Park and admitted that our art had no home here in New York City. 
Our theater practices came from a shared experience growing up in bicultural households and our practices and inspirations from the Chicano theater movement and community-based community performance practices. They were a common language in Los Angeles where we met and fell in love. In the shadows of the bright lights of Broadway, not so much. Still inspiration surrounded us. The downtown theater movement brought new ideas and possibilities to what we were creating. At the Living Theater space, Judith Molina hugged me, inviting me into her beautiful, nonviolent anarchist revolution, one of my favorite memories of being in the theater. We went to St. Anne's Warehouse and I watched work from all over the world and saw voices in a multitude of humanity. I met the artistic visionaries at Pregones in the Puerto Rican traveling theater who are my mentors to this day. These people and these places confirmed for us that if we wanted it, we could put forward our vision here. So much like the generations of radical artists who inspired us, we came to the same illogical solution. If there was no home for us, then we must make and take space for ourselves. Our vision was to create a space for people like us, members of the global majority who wanted to stand on the shoulders of the giants that came before us and push the boundaries of our form. As my dear friend and Delhi-based theater maker, Sudan Badeshpandi once told me, the loonies always find each other and we wanted to create a space for loonies. That space became Radical Evolution, an artist collective that as the name implied is forward thinking and reflective fast and slow, revolution and process. A purposeful, wonderful contradiction that both makes no sense and is perfectly coherent. Kind of like really good theater. We're now 12 years into this project and the world is a very different place, or at least it feels that way. It seems like each rotation takes us closer and closer to the last one that humanity will experience. Or at the very least, a cataclysm is on the horizon. In the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, Arundhati Roy called it a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. I think she was right in so many ways. In other ways, the challenges that have surfaced since then have been the same ones we've been fighting for centuries. I don't need to sit here and listen to them. Chances are when I just said this, at least one or two just popped into your head. And if I sat here and tried, I would run out of time. So let's just call them our fucked up inheritance and move forward. But the good news here is that if these challenges have been with us for a long time, so too are the solutions. Our ancestors gave us the answers if we're willing to listen. But Americans hate history. We hate it as culture. I think that's because we can't stand to admit that our past is terrible. Because if we have to do that, we also have to take ownership of it. So instead we just rewrite it, pretend it was different than what it was. Maybe make a musical that reimagines our past because it makes us feel more empowered. Or if it's terrible enough, we just forget it. After all, the dead aren't here to contradict us or to remind us, are they? That's a rhetorical question. They actually are here. Ghosts are very, very real. They have unfinished business and we are all haunted. So when I was thinking about what performance should be made, supported and shared throughout our city, I thought of all of this. I thought of the future, one informed by the past. And there's so many options, but this is what came up as the most important to me at this moment. We're living through a time where there's increased support for the value of labor. At the same time, only around 11% of US citizens are members of a union, and that number is decreasing. It's time artists see themselves as intimately connected to this larger struggle. We need better, stronger, more powerful solidarity between each other. Playwrights need more than a guild. Actors need more than equity. As Nick and Jack just put it to us, we are polydisciplinary creatures. We're more than cogs in the nonprofit industrial theater complex. Right now, whether we like it or not, we are all complicit in that machine and it's time we break it. The best way we can do that is through solidarity and not just solidarity between dancers, lighting designers and directors, but between artists, Amazon delivery persons, the auto workers and the taxi drivers. We're all in the same struggle. This is the truth our ancestors knew and fought for. It's why we have weekends. It's why we have an eight hour workday, at least in some industries, because we still have 10 out of 12s. 
Theater makers are not special snowflakes and we never have been, but the industries, the academies and the funders that support us have long put artists in this position, so much so that we become infantilized. We sit here in the belly of one of these beasts and I wanna say that we need to see these systems as the pro problematic oppressors that they are. And we can reject it. Not only can we do that, but artists are called to our practice to reimagine the world for a better. For many of us, these systems have placed a false narrative in our heads, one that tells us material wealth is possible in the current system. If there are any students here today, find four people in this room who've been doing this for more than 15 years. Ask them if it's possible to make a decent living solely off their labor as an artist. Listen to the answer, then ask them why they still do it. This change may seem impossible to do, but I wanted to put one more quote into this because my favorite writer is Ursula Le Guin. And she once said, this, power, uh, this change is impossible. Its power seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art. She went on to say that it begins with writers, the art of words. Maybe this moment needs more than words. Maybe it needs the art of action, the art of bodies and movement and vibration. So let's resist and change with the art of performance. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Yanti. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I identify as a theater director and a theater educator. I am the artistic director of a small company in New York called One Year Lease. Um, we work here in New York, and we just finished some summer programming in India, Japan, and Greece. Um, I want to thank Jess, Nick, and the Prelude Festival, first of all, for giving and all of these wonderful people and all of you for being here for this conversation, for giving space for this conversation. Um, my edges past being a theater director and educator are that in the past 20 years, I've also worked in arts management and in producing. I am Dutch Greek. Um, I'm a visitor here. I think I've landed on that. Um, I'm a single mother. Um, to to a quite um, capricious five-year-old. Um, I carry with me a deep interest and care for those who are displaced in our worlds today, um, those without homes whose histories are being erased and those who have nothing to return to. I'm not sure I wrote a manifesto either, but maybe I wrote a provocation. I don't know. Um, I wrote something of dreams. I dream of more ensembles for artists in this country. Um, and perhaps before I continue, I should define what ensemble is for me. Um, ensemble, as I see it, is a multitude of voices and approaches coming together out of curiosity. And once we have danced and conversed with each other, um, knowing that we'll never move or speak in exactly the same way again, because now we hold within us a community and a multitude of experiences. So I dream of more ensembles. I dream, I dream of value placed in working together over time, a value placed in a body of work as opposed to what the next show is, of ensembles with history, a particular dream of particularly dream of intergenerational ensembles, which celebrate and hold space for children, for parents, for the elderly, and for everything else between that um, and the words I have not said. Um, I dream of spaces that are less lonely and more revelatory, of the art leading instead of the business, of the art leading instead of the messaging, of the art leading instead of the funding and of the art leading instead of the day-to-day -day realities. I dream of companies that are artist-led, many of them, that provide homes, that provide spaces to dream, that provide spaces that welcome artists of all races, ethnicities, and cultures without having to make that diversity the conversation. 
I dream of spaces given to shows that are not easily marketable, but perhaps can create a conversation. Um, I dream of conversation in all of its complexity, of critics creating conversation instead of making or breaking a show, of spaces in which artists disagree and learn from each other over time. I think we're standing in an extraordinary time and I hope that we choose to build spaces that are complex, that are uneasy, while holding each other and uplifting the notion that we don't know how to do this, not that we do. Wow, thank you all so much. Um, there's so much to talk about. Um, can we go to that next slide? Um, so, so this is the part where you get to start to play. Um, this is one of two little moments. Um, so we're going to ask you, those of you who wanna play along, and that includes folks from home, to either boop that QR code or go to menti.com um, and enter the code 78484449. So that's, if you can't read that on the projector screen from a computer potentially, it's menti.com. And the code you put in is 78484449. And when you do, um, and it's that stuff that's on the left, or that stuff that's on the top is gonna stay there. So if you lose this screen, it's gonna be okay. You can still read the top, hopefully, or ask a friend. Um, we can go to the next slide now. Um, and so we're gonna, we kind of chose six categories of conversation and you can rank these. You can choose one, you can rank all six and then hit submit. Um, and the results will populate live and the most popular things will rise to the top and we'll use three of the top three things to help inform our game um, that we're gonna play next. But before we get there, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Jess. Sure, and, and I'm gonna just remind us that what we'd love to do now is just have all of you have quick responses of things that either resonated, that stood out for you or something that even might potentially have like um, been something that you're tangling with and, and not sure of. So we'll go around, um, Chie, if you'll start, what was like one uh, image, provocation, question, thought that stood out to you? I, they, I mean, the egregore is hard to, hard to lose. Um, but I am I'm interested in how how much conversation arose, sort of creating this like monstrous other lineage of of the problem or of the ghost or of the issue or of like the, there's a lot of <laughs> put a whole bunch of creative people on stage. Turns out we're gonna uh, make a monster out of the story. I love it. Um, but I think that's what I'm being left with is this this sort of ghostly image and. I don't know, do we kill it or make a new one? So that's what I'm sitting with. The two things, because I have two, um, <laughs> um, that I'm sort of left with is um, uh, one, the seven rights of the body, um, which I'm going to look up <laughs> and, and take home and like, you know, think about it. I think it's very interesting, the idea of like that, that concept actually, what our rights are, you know, as people got bodies. Um, and then um, uh, the workers' movement, you know, the workers' movement. Um, and what are we going to do? What are we going to do with this crappy, crappy sort of system that we have in terms of not for profits and commercial theater? And you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Um, and the, the options are not good. The options, both options are not good. And so, how do we break the wheel of this thing? Um, yeah, I appreciated the, the talk of the unions, the solidarity of the workers. Uh, yeah, I think similarly sort of mentioned the idea that there is like this, this entity, uh, that we all are like feeding and sort of worshiping and also hating and wanting to throw off and kill and continuing to feed and sort of, uh, why, um, 
that's very potent for me. And then the question of like, when in our work and when in our play do we not feel that present? And what are the conditions, like how do we build the conditions in which we notice that we're not feeding that ghost, that monster? So many things I'm thinking. Um, but um, I, I have a lot of words from, from your um, manifesto. Um, I have a nice list here. But I was also thinking now you're talking about the monster, and I was thinking, eh, let's decenter this. Like, why are you centering the monster? You know? So I, and I think I appreciate uh, your intervention um, because there were these words, right? Ensemble, process, intergenerality. Um, yeah, when you talk about the unions, the work, so um, yeah, so the decentering and 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 what are we doing? Yeah, what is the action? Yeah. I think there's a intersection between the ancestors and the children and the ensembles. And I think that's something to really consider, like that there's something really potent to me about thinking about that. So maybe I've just been thinking a lot about intergenerational work because I'm working with an artist in their 70s right now. So it's like the idea of, of that might just be coming to the top because I'm thinking about it, but it just seems like that there's something potent to think about that. Yeah, I, I I think I was left with Chia and the seven, sorry, what are they? They're seven oh, right. friends. And then you're taking a provocation and making it for me about a vision and um, that how much, uh, how much change we hold within our, our own bodies, how much change you, you started us with that, <laughs> you know, how, how much is, is this embodying of the, the, the possibilities, how much can we change with that? I don't know what any of that means, but that's where I was going. Wonderful. I think we're gonna use that as one of the layers. Uh, to our next movement in the panel, and we're going to play, unless we want to continue doing this. What do you, how are you feeling, Nick? No, let's play. Let's okay. play. Let's go play. Um, so we want to get on our feet, and you can go upstage or downstage, left and right, and the game goes like this. Um, we're going to read a statement, yes. or I will read a statement that will correspond to those top three categories that you've chosen. Thank you very much. And um, if the panelists uh, strongly agree with the statement, they're going to walk to that side of the stage all the way there. And if they strongly disagree, they're going to walk all the way there. And if they feel like they're in the middle, they're going to go where they feel in the middle. That makes sense to them. But upstage, downstage doesn't matter. It's just about stage that way. Okay. So people can take artistic liberties with upstage, downstage, and try not to read into it unless they say so. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree. Disagree and the spectrum in between. Um, good. Okay, so number one, public good. I need to take my glasses off, which is part of the reason that speaking has been hard um, because reading has been hard. Um, the performing arts contribute to the public good, even for those who cannot attend performances themselves. So, agree, disagree. You wanna read it again, Jess? Yes. The performing arts contribute to the public good, even for those who cannot attend performances themselves. Okay, find your spots, look at each other. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start with the most extreme agree, which is Jesse. Um, Jesse, why do you feel like you, you're here? Yeah, because I think art does. I think art does things to us that changes us, and that it actually changes our interactions with. with, with it, it, on, on one level, it doesn't matter that like you know someone didn't come to a play, someone else came to the play and changed them in the world. 
Cool. I'm going to go, I think, to Beto, who I think is the most strongly disagree and find out what your thoughts are there. I am on this side of the half. <laughs> <laughs> I think my response, can you read the prompt? Absolutely. Uh, the performing arts contribute to the public good, even for those who cannot attend performances themselves. Yeah, so, I mean, it's gonna be interesting. I think I have a question around what this term, the public good means and how are we interpreting it? And um, the kind of larger questions I have around that. So I don't feel like I can go all the way because I feel like I can think about some things that would make me want to step a little bit closer to the middle. Cool. cool. Does anyone want to add something else in? I do. Yeah. Um, can I just use this? Yeah. It ended up in my hands. Um, I think the word that struck me was can't, because the reason I was like, wait, do I want to be actually all the way over here for a second? Mostly because if we aren't thinking about why can't people get to the theater and what are the things that are stopping that from happening, then I wonder about the good that we are doing if the, if the thought process does not include everybody should be able to get to the theater. So that it was the word can't that made me actually want to run that way and then I was confused, so. Yeah. Or, the, or the theater can get to them, or the theater can go to them. Like why we think that people have to get to a space that calls theater, right? Right. And I, I just want to, yeah, question, I'm going to stand over here to ask this question, <laughs> which is, um, who is the theater, what is the public, right, in particular, how do we define the public, we tend to generalize that and have vague notions that can cover up some biases in our thinking, um, and, and one of the things that's been really productive for me and Jess in our public humanities space here at the Graduate Center has been to try to be very specific about the publics we're trying to serve. And that is a challenge that I think I would put forward to everybody when we use this term. <clears throat> I was hoping we'd get here and I'm glad you did. So it's a little bit of a provocation. Um, do you have anything else? Anyone else? Cool, no, it's okay. We have a lot of time to talk about this stuff as seated people. So I'm gonna read the next one. This one is about economic models. The responsibility to fix the arts economy should fall to the government. Agree over there, disagree over here. The responsibility to fix the arts economy should fall to the government. Yanti, I'm going to start by putting you on the spot because you're the strongest to agreeing with that. Well, I, again, I, yeah, it should fall to the government and to many other things. It, 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 uh, I don't think that the, this government in this country pays any attention or enough attention to the arts. So I don't want to go over there and take them off the hook. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go over there because I don't think that I think when we speak of government, what sort of government, because I don't think we're living in a true democracy. So I, I certainly don't want to give that power there. Um, yeah, that's why I'm standing here. Chie, do you want to share what you're thinking? I mean, I think I'm back to defining our terms here, like fix and should and government, like these are all giant words for for giant spectral shapes that I don't want to give that much responsibility or power to. What do you believe <laughs> about this stuff? Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, what, do, what do I believe about this stuff? Um, I mean, I think I come back to what I was talking about in my manifesto. I think I believe that we all have bodies. I think that those bodies feel things and that very often the things that we are feeling and experiencing need to be the heart of our own experience. And that we have to listen more to that voice and it has to be less about like who should fix the stuff and the monsters and more about what can we take responsibility for in our own lives to send those ripples out to create change i think thank you that's great <laughs> and then, yeah i was going to say one more i was thinking about marisol who in her um 
uh, manifesto publication talked to us about representation. So I feel like representation is part of the public good and it's also um, part of uh, this question of the economics of who should who should help us. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts to um, what, what comes to your mind and your position that you're sitting in and, and with the audiences that you work with. We have a government that wants to destroy government. <laughs> um, we have a government that doesn't want to feed children. We have a government that wants children in debt for school lunch. Uh, I, I, I don't have a better idea developed at this moment, except like us, we have to figure some things out together. Uh, but at this particular time, I would say, and especially when it comes to the arts and anything that might be a seed for change or revolution or care, care was another important word that came up in our conversation. Like, I just don't have high hopes for our government. Uh, I'm like actually bored of that question in a way, like, I think this is true probably of all artists, but definitely in the theater for young audiences world, we're like, look what we could do if only we had the money of Denmark or the UK or Australia. Like, okay, and and what, right? I feel like I wanna be like clone, like and be there and be there. <laughs> um, because I, I, I do think that it's really horrible that this government doesn't value art. It's horrible. There is no places, there is no value system uh, to create memories in children so that they can grow up and feel like empathy to arrive to a theater to wow, you know, to create this memory that you create with your family going to the theaters, not necessarily to a football game, these memories that you create when you're date, when you're like teenager and you're going to see a play together. Um, there is, um, I'm, I feel sorry because I experienced those memories and, um, and they're powerful. So I feel that there is also an amazing way for artists here to be advocates and to really look into policy changing and really like because um because they're afraid of artists because we're not ever be a centralized system um you know when i was working as a citizen lobbyist in albany um, um they used to say like oh yeah artists is dangerous because you don't know who the leader is they just pop um and um and I, I think there is a lot of power that we all have here that we really could use to really get to that place where we can increase budgets, where we can really think about unionizing. But like, that's the key, like the arts needs more money <laughs> and the government in a way needs to step up and not just, you know, the philanthropy mask with what we know is mask. Cool. We're at the last of the three. Um, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just also wanted to take a moment and share that this thing that Jess brought up at the beginning that we'd worked on a decade ago called the Brooklyn Commune was kind of like a manifesto. And one of the things that we discovered pretty early on was this book from 1965 called Performing Arts, The Economic Dilemma by William Baumol and William Bowen. And it's out of print, but if you want to get in touch with us, we have ways of understanding it or getting it to you. And especially the Brooklyn Commune report itself does the highlights. But the whole idea of it is that the, they were asked at the beginning of the NEA's founding, what should we expect for the arts economy moving forward? Please, these young economists, will you do a study for us and study the sector and what should be happening? And the, the, the discovery was that Every year, the arts will cost more and more money in a capitalist system because the rest of the economy can more or less 
lower the cost of doing it by making things more efficient over time. But theater, like healthcare and like education, are dependent on live human to human interactions. They cannot be sped up. Like you cannot re uh, rehearse Macbeth uh -huh, um, faster. Is they use it in the in the in the in the study. So I'm quoting that as part of the script. Um, <laughs> And uh, if you can't rehearse that faster now than you could 200 years ago. And so if we're understanding this fundamental premise that it's gonna be more and more expensive every year, what do we do about that? The government could be one way, um, but it's something that we need to have a plan for maybe, yeah. Well, we're finding out that these kind of broad statements are really um, both, uh, welcoming of a lot of thought, but also really a maybe a frustrating structure to work with. But we do have one more, uh, which is the audience. Um, and the, the broad statement, um, strongly agree, disagree, theater is relevant to people today. <laughs> yeah, stand somewhere where you feel like you have a people in mind. Yeah. I like that. You can keep moving if that's how you feel. I like this. Hard holding. <laughs> Jesse, how are you feeling about this question? It's, well, it's like clearly not. The audiences didn't come back after the pandemic, you know? And we're busy trying to blame Netflix on it. And like, but like the audiences came back to clubs. You know, ever try and get a ticket to like a, a club night? You can't get a ticket. It's impossible. You have to race your friends to get tickets. And there's live performance there. And there's people going out there and they're spending a lot of money. And there's there's young people there. And there's brown people there. And there's trans people there, you know? And theater likes to be like, oh no, those people don't exist. They don't go out. Um, but they do go out. They just don't come to our house. And it's us, it's not them, you know. Um, uh, so is it relevant? No, but the reason why I'm like, kind of in, it's like it could be, and some is, it could be. Who wants to chime in next? Beto, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think that my assumption here is that we're seeing theater is relevant. And the reason why I'm over here is because I'm assuming that we're talking about the institution of theater, not the art form of theater, not the theater that happens between all people all the time and the idea of performance that happens and surrounds us every day. I'm making the assumption you're talking about theater as in like the spaces where people say like, hey, do you wanna go see a play, right? And that, I agree with you, Jesse, just run the numbers, right? Although it is worthwhile that Netflix is really in danger of going bankrupt and might not be around for a while. So like, there's something going on. It's also completely economically unstable and has been from its beginning. But like the, so I, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm like saying, and I mean, obviously like my, my writing is talking about that, right? Like this institution itself, this idea of itself I don't know if it's relevant anymore. I don't know. I think it may have served its purpose, you know, and maybe it's time to think about something different. And I, I want to jump in with an intervention here. I was at a conversation the other day and something that links uh, what Beto was saying of what are we defining as theater and something I think that Marisol brings up too in terms of us thinking of who is making theater and attending theater is that there are high schools and middle schools and people are doing musicals all the time yeah. and plays all the time and parents are coming as audience and family is coming as audience so when we're thinking of theater what is the theater that we're thinking about because maybe it is relevant to audiences today and we're just a little bit too elite in our in our ideas yeah, like if you... <laughs> uh yes uh yes there's something that happens right there's something that happens where it's like everybody understands K through 12th grade, what it is to like try out for a play and be in a show and be in a play or like be in a dance recital or like play in your orchestra, play in your band, right? Like 
everybody understands that. And then something happens after we have structures of school where things get professionalized and some people are artists and some people are not and some people belong inside the theater and some people don't and some people can afford a ticket and some other people don't and then the institution of the theater becomes the question whereas like do you want to do a play everyone's like yeah I want to do a play um like yes I want to sing uh whatever something from guys and dolls like yes I do um so yeah, I just wanna, I'm just echoing sort of what you were saying, Jess, and also Beto, what you brought up about like, what do we mean when we say that? People are hungry for it. And I've also, you know, worked as a community engagement professional in some respects for some theaters where it's like, oh, we got hundreds of people to talk to us about making a show about their town. And then we had an intergenerational ensemble of like from eight, ages eight to like 96 or something of 60 people, 70 people who wanted to be on stage and tell their story, right? Once the barriers to access were lowered and it was like, this is actually yours. <laughs> this is yours, it's for you, it's by you. And we're listening to the story that you wanna tell and the way you wanna tell it. So I'm hopeful, <laughs> I'm over here, I'm hopeful. Yeah, thank you for that. I also think that there is like, we can generalize, right? Audience don't come back to the theater, but it's that, you know, like through the pandemic, I, 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 like there were so many shows <laughs> uh, that had packed spaces. Do we think a packed space is a 500, 800 house proscenium, right? That's, those are questions. Uh, there's the street. There was so much art going on. Like I've been creating for the whole pandemic and we had sold out shows. And so I feel that's why I walk in right away. Like, yeah, it depends like where. Um, so go back to, yeah, that generalization where it always keep leading us to. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm kind of hearing, let's make it easier to plug in for people and we can democratize theater a lot more than we are. And let's maybe make smaller theaters. <laughs> and and fund those more um, and stop having the burden for, for everything to be huge because the ticket sales so rarely pay for things anyway. But I, I also just want to like acknowledge that time flew by real fast and and maybe we should just like kind of stay in our meandering positions for like the last 10 minutes of, of chatting. Um, and so and so grab a mic if you don't have one. Um, and it looks like everyone almost got them so um and we'll and we can go to the next slide if we don't mind so that's for you at home and you in the audience you can just write anything you want now like if you got a question throw it up there um if you have uh, a thought please share it um if it gets mean towards a person or a group we're going to shut it down but other than that do your thing um and uh and yeah so do you wanna? Yeah, so I think because we just have 10 minutes left and because we were also the, we were thinking, we, we did focus this for a moment on New York City. Like I think giving us all the question for a moment of um, how could New York City pull through for you? That's the question that I would love to find your responses to. Yeah, how could New York City pull through for you? Mm -hmm. Which is similar to the question on the screen. What are you hopeful about or looking forward to? But in the, you know, in a way. Who wants to go first? But I want to hear from everyone on that one. If you got something. Can I, can I reframe the question? Can we re reframe the question is like, how can we pull through for New York City? Like, why, why does the city need to do something for me? Why are we not helping the city? Right? What is our role in the conversation, right? In the dialogue, in the action? Do you want to answer it? Well, I asked the question. <laughs> I have a, I, I, I can, I can, but I, I'd rather hear other people first. Yanti, do you have something? Yes, I have to. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking of this with the last, the last statement. I'm like, are we talking about New York City? Or are we talking about the U.S.? Are we? I, I think New York City 
and more so than I don't know. If, I don't know if that's a true statement, but it is a city of immigrants. And um, when I think of theater uh, being being important, uh, there are so many different cultural reasons people go to the theater. That um, how do we how do we create spaces to hold all of those? Um, and what am I hopeful about is that. Um, we can think about space differently. We can think about where do people go to ex this need. And I think people need, do need theater. So what spaces can we create that, that answer that need? And I don't, I, don't, I don't know where those spaces are, but um, I think some of them are religious spaces. Some of them are, are, are public spaces. I, I think, New York City, and I think it does this in some ways, but I think we need to keep rethinking of where do people go and, and how do we reach, how do we go to them? Y'all are really populating like some hardcore questions up here. Um, but we'll answer every single one of them. Um, uh, I've been in New York City for a long time. And one thing I will say is that the relationship between New York City must be reciprocal for me. So New York City mm. does owe me, honey. New York City <laughs> owes me a lot. I've given the city a lot, and she better pay. So I'm um, number one. I, I'd say, but they're they're different things. I think I, I every every single day I owe New York City kindness. You know, and that is the only way to get around the city is to like pay it with kindness, 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 and hope that other people will pay you with kindness too. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing about New York City. Um, but in terms of like what New York City can like you know give give me or how how it can like come through for me, for the art, for artists and stuff like that. It has to do with, it has to do with space as well. Um, I wish that New York City would do something that would give artists space to work in. You know, like yeah, um, just that one thing is such a gigantic barrier to creating art. Um, and I, I teach students and I wonder with these students, um, because I always tell them, don't wait for the institutions, just go out and create your art. Um, but like when I was like, you know, when, when we were like had our data companies and stuff like that, you know, you still do, but like, um, but back in the day when we were like, but kids, um, the, the, the spaces were easier to get. They were easier to like, you know, hustle through, trick your way into. And now how do young people get space these days? If New York City could give us space, which there's a lot of empty spaces um, because New York City is going through a weird time. I want New York City to give us empty spaces just to play in and to make weird theater in. I think that'd be good. And it's there. There's so much empty space. But I do think it's it's easy to forget, I think, that we live on a series of islands. <laughs> and like in an island, real estate will always be at a premium, right? And so like that's something like that question of space and what it means. But I also say really some of my favorite theater happens on the subway. So <laughs> yes. give those guys, give those break dancers a couple of bucks every time you see them, they're working their butts off, it's awesome. I'm hopeful about co-ops mm -hmm. um, and how we, to bring the unionization conversation in and the shared labor conversation in and the sustainability conversation in and the hopeful conversation in, we're answering them all, all at once. Um, and the public good conversation in and the being open for breakfast and going until 2 a.m. conversation in, I think it's about shared space models whether it's an actual like co-op shape or not, but it's something about uh, mixed use spaces and bringing in creative people from different areas and different fields and with different things to say and creating space that doesn't have that sort of like elitist theater thing, because um, clearly that's not working. Um, and that offers just more intentional ways to to ask those questions to folks who were not asking those questions to on a daily basis. Um, I love all these questions, thoughts, and reflections. Um, and I was thinking, what's giving you life and keeping you here right now? And it's so interesting that you tackle go into space and then the space details became the thing. And at the beginning, I was like, well, my community really is like, it's like the people who wanna work with us, uh, the interns that email and want to intern in our place, um, the, you know, just like the people who want to support, you know, it's just like, but then I was like, wait, 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 but all that is possible because you have access to space. We did fought a lot for that space, but 
it is possible because there is a space like a start, this casa de pensamiento, this is space in which we can gather. Um, so it's 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 that and that house of thought or of where you do things, whether it's ritual, whether it's cooking, eating together, performing together, uh, fighting together, <laughs> uh, in generative confrontation, like we'd say at LeMay. Um, it's I think it's key not because we cannot do theater and performance in other places, like you say, the so well, like I love like we are places to perform, but there is something that we need this sort of circle spaces so that we can tune to each other in the values that we want to resonate with in the world or that we want to create those resonance in the world. So yeah, I think definitely we really have to, somehow organized for that kind of chair space, being creative, solidarity economy, feel what that means to us right now and, and, and how we're going to uh, work together. Yeah. And Marisol, I think you haven't answered yet, right? I haven't answered. But I was gonna also just give, the, uh, I love that I think you're the last one to answer and you are the New Yorker among us on this stage who is, hey. you know, born <laughs> and been here from the beginning of your life. So it's kind of lovely that we have you with some thoughts. Yeah, I guess uh, this call for space really resonates with me. Space to, to in which to make, to attune, to be in circle together. And then I'm like, let's take it to the streets. Like, why don't we have a street theater festival, a busking festival? Like, we have all these incredible artists everywhere. Um, and I wonder also if that's a way of democratizing not only who is regarded as an artist, but also who has access to the art. You know, Jimena, you could make a piece in your space that you're blessed to have access to, bring it to the street, and then like, the dude playing electric violin like a like a genius in the subway can also play in the same festival right um so yeah I just I think I don't know the city feels really hard right now it feels really hard it's hard to be on the street in New York right now um it's feeling like it used to back in the day when I was like a, a little a little baby um but you know we're all here so we can we're making it happen and we're we're hopeful we keep keeping on because of our community and um our our foolish and beautiful sense of possibility so we keep going thank you you know i'm i'm inspired by so much of the way that this conversation has flowed and and I'm, you know, going back to this question of manifestos and avant-garde and, and like what matters there. And I think for the last 100, 150 years, we've been so concerned about finding what is new in the theater, aesthetically, politically. But I, I think what I'm hearing and also feeling today is like a return to something ancient, which is something that is denied to us in most of our daily life about being in a room together and being vulnerable and learning from each other about that or watching people do that. And that's no offense to our friends on, on the robots, but like, I do, I do think it's different. Um, and, and I find hope there. I find, I find, I know I've been transformed there. And the only thing that I will add is that, uh, Jimeno, when you talked about progress and it's always, the future is now and is happening and we are always in the moment of becoming and to remember that with the ancient and, the, and with the ritual, it is centered on our ability to continue to become. And I think that that is one of the essential qualities that theater and performance has that other media and genres don't. So thank you for an amazingly wonderful uh, filled conversation tonight. And thank you all for being with us. And yeah, so we have just some quick things and you guys can feel free to pack your stuff and get ready and do whatever you need to do. But we would like to thank again, the Prelude staff. We'd like to thank, thank Frank 
and the team at Prelude. We'd like to thank CUNY Graduate Center and the Theater and Performance Art Program and HowlRound for streaming this event. Um, and we want to remember that on Saturday, 1014, from 9 to 1 at the Tank, there's going to be a dance party and awards for people to go to. It's 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Um, it's going to say a.m. Awesome. It's an all-day dance party for me. <laughs> and um, and most, most importantly, um, we are going to be at a bar next. And that is, oh, at, uh, oh, wait, no, I was going to, you're going to say that part. I'm going to say that the tank is located on 36th Street because they're both located on the same street. And so is the bar. Exactly. That's why I was also confused. on 36th Street. So, so 36th Street is happening this year uh, yeah, for Preludes. That's, that's about us. But if you want to continue the conversation, we'll be continuing it. Um, so thanks everyone for being here digitally and in the future also, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Yeah.